Hey everybody, today I'm continuing my series on the aphorism with the waste books of Georg Christoph Lichtenberg. Lichtenberg comes about a century after La Rochefoucauld, whom I covered in my previous video on the aphorism. Uh, he was born in 1742 and died in 1799. He began his waste books, as he called them, in 1765, and then they broke off, of course, at his death in 1799. He is credited with introducing the aphorism into German literature. The origin of these waste books comes from the waste books themselves, where he says, merchants have a waste book in which they enter from day to day everything they have bought and sold, all mixed up together in disorder. From this, it is transferred to the journal, in which everything is arranged more systematically. And finally, it arrives in the ledger, in double entry after the Italian manner of bookkeeping. This deserves to be imitated by the scholar. First, a book in which I inscribe everything, just as I see it, or as my thoughts prompt me. Then this can be transferred to another, where the materials are more ordered and segregated, and the ledger can then contain a connected construction and the elucidation of the subject that flows from it, expressed in an orderly fashion. So based on that description of what he's trying to do here, it's less uh, singular in form than Rochefoucauld, where in here you get musings and witticisms and random thoughts and apothem and apothems and proverbs and similes. It's also really hard to pin down Lichtenberg. Um, some things can be really contradictory. Um, we shouldn't hold this against him for two reasons. One, because we're human and we contain multitudes, so along with Walt Whitman we can chant very well, I contradict myself. Two, these are waste books in which he's dumping everything in a very disordered and ephemeral fashion over the course of a very long time, and one would hope that one changes over time. He, of course, was a scientist and a man of letters, an 18th century polymath. He was an experimental physicist, an astronomer, a mathematician, a practicing critic of art and literature. So like most Renaissance men, his intellect covered a wide swathe of topics. This also prompted the book by Pierre Sange, Fragments of Lichtenberg. It is sort of a, a reconstruction uh, across the ages of scholars trying to piece together all these fragments into a coherent system. And the best part about it is that, as you can imagine, all these different interpretations uh, emerge and you get all these different versions of Lichtenberg. He's definitely in the vein of Emerson, especially as exemplified in his uh, American Scholar, where he talks about how, you know, books um, should not triumph over experience. Nonetheless, even in the days of Dante, one praised the ancients without knowing why. This respect for poets one does not understand and yet wishes to equal is the source of the bad writing. In our literature. Careful observation of nature or of mathematics is certainly the most effective specific against madness. Has he met Georg Cantor? No. The desire to know a lot in a short time often hinders us from precise examination. That plagues me. Be attentive, feel nothing in vain, measure and compare. This is the whole law of philosophy. It is easy to construct a landscape out of a mass of disorderly lines, but disorderly sounds cannot be made into music. He never got a chance to meet Stravinsky, did he? There are very few things of which we can acquire a conception through all five senses. Aphorisms like that cause me to sit and think and want to prove it wrong so badly. He was so witty that anything served him as an intermediate form for comparing any pair of other things with one another. That's exactly how I feel about Douglas Hofstadter. His ability to draw analogy is uncanny. Here's an interesting thought. It is silly to assert that we are sometimes not really in the mood for anything. I believe that the moment in which we feel strong enough to suppress one of our principal drives, namely the drive to work and act, is the moment when we are perhaps best fitted to undertake the strangest and greatest things. He had outgrown his library as one outgrows a waistcoat. Libraries can in general be too narrow or too wide for the soul. He was then in his 54th year 
when even in the case of poets, reason and passion begin to discuss a peace treaty and usually conclude it not very long afterwards. It is a fault which the merely clever writer has in common with the downright bad one, that he commonly fails to illuminate his actual subject, but employs it only to show off. We get to know the writer, but nothing else. And that's the exact type of writing and writer that I love. The older one grows, presuming one grows wiser with age, the more one loses the hope of being able to write better than the authors of antiquity. Past pain is in recollection pleasant. So is past pleasure. Future pleasure is also pleasant, as is present pleasure. Thus, all that torments us is present and future pain. To the great genius, it always occurs to ask, could this too not be false? Libraries will in the end become cities, said Leibniz. Even truth needs to be clad in new garments if it is to appeal to a new age. Once we know our weaknesses, they cease to do us any harm. We are only too inclined to believe that if we possess a little talent, work must come easily to us. You must exert yourself, man, if you want to do something great. Whenever he composes a critical review, I have been told, he gets a tremendous erection. What? Nowadays, three witty turns of phrase and a lie make a writer. That man is the noblest creature may also be inferred from the fact that no other creature has yet contested this claim. When a book and a head collide and a hollow sound is heard, must it always have come from the book? If we thought more for ourselves, we would have very many more bad books and very many more good ones. Nothing can contribute more to peace of soul than the lack of any opinion whatsoever. And here we have a reference to Rochefoucauld, although a bit dismissive. Man is not so hard to know, as many a stay-at-home believes when in his dressing gown he rejoices to discover that one of Rochefoucauld's remarks is true. How is it going? A blind man asked a cripple. As you see, the cripple replied. Something witty can be said against anything and for anything. A witty man could, of course, say anything against this assertion that would perhaps make me regret it. The oracles have not so much ceased to speak, rather men have ceased to listen to them. What a pity it isn't a sin to drink water, cried an Italian. How good it would then taste. The detection of small errors has always been the property of minds elevated little or not at all above the mediocre. Notably, elevated minds remain silent or say something only in criticism of the whole, while the great spirits refrain from censoring and only create. This reminds me of Emerson when he talks about how man hopes genius creates. The world offers us correction more often than consolation. When one condemned to death is given another hour, it is worth a lifetime. It is almost impossible to bear the torch of truth through a crowd without singeing somebody's beard. I said to myself, I cannot possibly believe that. And as I was saying it, I noticed I had already believed it a second time. To make man as religion wants him to be resembles the undertaking of the Stoics. It is only another grade of the impossible. I have always found that the so-called bad people gain in one's estimation when one gets to know them better, and good people decline. The American who first discovered Columbus made a bad discovery. The book which most deserves to be banned would be a catalog of banned books. Just as there are polysyllabic words that say very little, so there are also monosyllabic words of infinite meaning. Writing is an excellent means of awakening in every man the system slumbering within him. I forget most of what I have read, just as I do most of what I have eaten, but I know that both contribute no less to the conservation of my mind and my body on that account. The fly that does not want to be swatted is safest if it sits on the fly's water. The most perfect ape cannot draw an ape. Only man can do that. But, likewise, only man regards the ability to do this as a sign of superiority. What makes it so difficult to study a profound philosophy is the fact that in everyday life we regard a host of things as being so natural and easy we find it impossible to believe they could ever be any different. The sure conviction that we could, if we wanted to, 
is the reason so many good minds are idle. We live in a world in which one fool can make many fools, but one wise man only a few wise ones. How much in the world depends on presentation is already evident from the fact that coffee drunk out of a wine glass is a very unpleasant drink, or from the sight of meat being cut at table with a pair of scissors.